Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my Ohio garden. I wanted to share an update of what is going on in the garden as of the beginning of October. It's October 6th as of me filming this. And I've got some good news. We finally got some rain. Now, granted, it was less than half of an inch, but it's something. It's been an extraordinarily dry late summer, early fall here in Midwestern Ohio. And it's been a challenge to get a lot of my fall crops established, but let's take a look. Starting up in the front of the garden, I finally got some more herbs planted in my intended medicinal herb garden area here. A couple of weeks ago, I got this all cleared out. I had a lot of volunteer flowers, cleome, zinnias, that type of thing in here this summer. Cleared that all out and got some of my winter sown herbs planted. I did a winter sowing test this past winter that included some perennial herbs such as comfrey, valerian, soapwort, marshmallow, and rue, and had pretty good success with some of them. I'll show you here some of these that I finally got transplanted. And a lot of you had questions about whether comfrey could be winter sown from seed with success, and it was actually one of the most successful herbs in this whole test for me. Now in this corner, this was a fun little surprise for me this year. I had this hardy Chicago fig growing in a pot for several years. I wasn't doing a great job caring for it. I left it outside unprotected. We got a really cold snap last December and I assumed it was dead. I dumped that plant out of the pot, root ball, soil and all, put it on the compost pile, forgot about it. Well, this spring I was working in the compost and happened to notice that this plant was actually sprouting out. I rehomed her, put her in this corner of the garden and I'm hopeful that maybe I can keep this plant going in ground. Figs are marginally hardy here in zone six. I'm in six A, they do a little better in six B and a protected area. But with some of the hardiest varieties, like this hardy Chicago, typically if you do grow them here, they will grow during the warmer months, die back to the ground in the winter, and then sprout up fresh in the spring. The general advice is that they will do better if you winter protect them. So some people will actually lay them down, cover them with mulch, I'm, <laughs> I'm just not gonna put that much effort into it. So I'm hopeful that if I just mulch the root zone really well this winter, she'll sprout back for me in the spring and I can grow her in the ground versus in pots because it's definitely my preferred method. Now I've still got quite a lot of tomatoes going on. In spite of it being October, as of a couple days ago, we were still close to 90 degrees, which is really unusual for us here. So tomatoes are still quite happy. I do have some disease setting in some stink bug pressure, which I don't often get on tomatoes, but most of my indeterminate varieties are still quite productive. Now this is one called Buffalo Sun, big bicolor beefsteak type. This has done really well in my gardens as has its sister line Buffalo Steak, which is a red beefsteak tomato. 
Peppers are still producing really well right now. Now, peppers in general are a later maturing crop for me here in Ohio as compared to something like tomatoes. Typically, I'm seeing my largest flush of mature fruit through September into October, right up until that first fall frost, which for me is typically right around the middle of October. Now this planting in particular was a lot of fun because many of these varieties are from the All American Selections trials. All American Selections is a private nonprofit organization which evaluates new varieties of vegetables and flowers every year, has judges all across the United States, and basically these judges are growing out varieties, evaluating them for things like flavor, um, disease resistance, yield, all of those things which will make a plant really, really great in the garden. And then each year winners are awarded. Now AAS is actually a great resource for home gardeners because you can get on their website and view every year's winners and there are regional winners identified as well. So this is really handy for identifying which new plants might do well in your region. So you can get on there and look at say the winners for the Midwest or the South. And those varieties are ones that have performed exceptionally well for judges in those specific regions. So chances are they will do really well for you also. And we just wrapped up the judging cycle for this season. So I am as in the dark as all of you. I get to find out the winners hopefully pretty soon, but I had some really promising ones in my garden and I will let you all know which ones I like the best as soon as I find out what they were because I judge them all under numbers. It's a, it's a blind evaluation basically. So that's been a lot of fun this year. Now I just finished cleaning out this bed yesterday. This has unfortunately become the target for some burrowing critters. I think chipmunks, but I'm not certain. So one of this winter's projects is all about figuring out ways to eradicate some of these pests that have become very problematic in my gardens. Remarkably, the rainbow chard back here is still doing quite well, despite obvious tunneling right around the root systems and a lack of rain. So I'm happy about that at least, but these raised beds also unfortunately are really starting to deteriorate. My husband made these, I think about five years ago, and I opted for untreated pine because I didn't wanna pay for cedar but they're definitely starting to break down. We've got a lot of bowing, rot. Um, again, with this critter tunneling, it's not helping anything, but I'm going to have to figure out some solutions because I really like these raised beds here in this area. I don't want to completely dismantle them. So I'm thinking about ways to basically take material and frame in this existing wood so that I can keep these beds right where they are. At this point, corrugated metal sheeting seems like it might be the easiest, but if anyone has any suggestions, I'd love to hear them. And you can see here, I'm testing out all kinds of chipmunk trapping devices. This is one that I saw touted as the best method to get rid of chipmunks. So far, I've caught one in this sunflower bucket. I'm also testing out a chipmunkinator trap, um, a standard live trap, rat traps. I plan to share the results I have with all these different traps, but again, in the meantime, if anyone has any suggestions on getting rid of chipmunks, happy to hear those suggestions as well. In the next raised bed, this is one of my favorite plants of the entire season this year. This is Ruby Moon Hyacinth Bean. And this is a plant for some reason I'd never grown personally before. I've, I've known about these, but just never tried them in my own garden. I saw them at my sister's farm last year and had to have it. I got these planted a little late, but what a fun plant from the beautiful purple blooms to these really decorative purple seed pods. This is definitely one I will be planting every season from here on out. And then the other plant in this bed, which has pretty much taken over everything. I, when I planted this, I was not aware that this variety would get quite so big. I think this is only two plants that have basically taken up, oh, a good three quarters or more of this bed. This is a ground cherry, specifically the variety Cosex pineapple. Incredibly productive, incredibly sprawling habit. In hindsight, I would have given this an area back toward the back of the garden where it had plenty of room to grow, but it's done really, really well. Again, one of those plants here that just needs minimal care, minimal attention, and still is very, very productive. So much so that I have more ground cherries than <laughs> 
we will ever eat in like five years. But it is a lot of fun. Kids tend to like these a lot between this unique way that these little berries form inside these husks and you kind of pop them out. And they do have a very sweet, fruity, almost pineapple-like flavor. Here I've got collards. This was spring planted. This is a variety called Top Chop. Very, very strong performer in my garden. You can see here, this is where I got kind of negligent and I was not um, keeping an eye on cabbage worm damage. Later in the year, it's often the cross-striped cabbage worms, which become a bigger problem. And I've noticed that they're actually, at least they seem to be more voracious than your typical imported cabbage worm, which is the caterpillar of that cabbage white butterfly. So all this damage here, I got on top of this, I started spraying with BT, and you can see it's put on all this lovely new clean growth here. And this is a great crop because it's heat tolerant and cold tolerant, and these will actually become even tastier as, as we get frosty nights. A lot of areas where I am cleaning out summer crops, so I had tomatillos here as well as some semi-indeterminate shell beans. Recently got those all cleaned out and thrown in the compost. Here is a late planted summer squash. And obviously this thing will get nailed as soon as we get that first frost. Most of the flowers through here are volunteers. There's a lot of holy basil, cosmos, calendula, nicotiana, um, some volunteer zinnias back here. I just transplanted some rhubarb into this area. I've also got a lot of mustard cover crop popping up through there. In this bed, some kale. I've also got sweet potatoes in here. I, I'm not expecting much from these. They were late planting and I have not watered them. <laughs> so we'll see what happens when I dig these after the frost kills all the foliage back. Back in this corner, I've got runner beans on this trellis. I'm actually going to harvest these for seeds, so I'm waiting for these pods to dry down on the plant. I'll harvest them, make sure they're dry, throw them in mason jars with probably a little desiccate packet, and I'll be able to plant these next spring. And then in this raised bed is my summer sowing carrot test. If you've not already, check out this video. I was basically testing out methods to see what helped me get the best germination when sowing seed in the hot, dry uh, month of late July or August, which is typically when I have to sow my carrots for a fall harvest. And these are all doing quite well. I've got a few little lettuces tucked in here too. And then of course, probably one of the most exciting harvests that are going on in the month of October, all the winter squash and pumpkins and gourds and those types of cucurbits. And behind me, I've got a butternut squash. This is a variety called Ceres. And butternut squash is not necessarily my favorite of all the winter squash, but I tend to grow it every year because it's, it's just really reliable. Butternuts tend to be less appealing to squash vine borers. They typically store quite well. So they're kind of like my old reliable standby. This is the first time that I've grown this variety and it's done really well in the garden. And now some of these are ready for picking already, but not everything. So again, I'm gonna let this go until the frost and see how many of these fruit we can get to mature. Now with winter squash and pumpkin to test maturity, I use the thumbnail test. And I've got a whole video on how I do that specifically, as well as curing and storing winter squash and pumpkins. But thumbnail test is super easy. I just simply go to the shoulder or kind of the top third of the fruit near the stem, push a thumbnail into that rind, and if my thumbnail can make an imprint, it's not mature. If I can't make an imprint, that fruit is mature and ready for harvest and curing if necessary. And then over here, another pepper. This is one of my all-time favorites. This is a variety called Mad Hatter. This is a Bacatum type. So typically these are very, very hot. Like I would not be able to eat a typical Bacatum, but they have this really nice fruity flavor. And what the breeding with Mad Hatter has done has gotten that unique flavor into a pepper that is very, very mildly hot, but it's very crunchy, very juicy, sweet and fruity. A really nice addition to hot sauces with some other hot peppers mixed in. 
Now, I was really worried I wasn't going to get any fruit off of this pepper period this year. The plant was very, very stressed from the beginning and I wasn't certain what was going on. And this was a plant I just kind of threw in this bed because I had extra. So it wasn't like being super diligent about its care, but it just kept looking worse and worse. The leaves were droopy. They were yellowing. And when I got in here and really investigated, I found this weird insect that I had never seen in my garden before. I also noticed that there were a lot of ants present, very similar to the way <laughs> very similar to the way that you'll see ants when they are farming aphids on a plant, but there were no aphids on here. Now, as I observed longer and longer and the season went on, I started to see that these insects were developing into something to, that to me looked like a leaf hopper. Thankfully, my sister helped me solve this mystery. What this insect is, is a keeled tree hopper. Again, not something I've ever had problems with in my garden before and certainly not on peppers, but this is something that seems to be becoming kind of a common theme where we're having insect problems that really have never been seen in this area before. I've not had enough time to research what to do to help prevent or get rid of this pest yet, if anyone has dealt with keeled tree hoppers on their peppers and have a good organic solution, definitely let me know. But it's something that I know that I'll have to be on the lookout for next year. Now, thankfully, this pepper ended up being okay. It ended up producing, but it was definitely stressed all season. And I would have had better production if that had not been the case. So just kind of one of those interesting garden learning experiences here. Now, moving toward the back of the garden, if you saw my video on fall cover cropping, you might recognize some of these planting areas. Again, a lot of spots where summer crops have come out and I've planted cover crop in their spot. But I do have some warm season hangers on, such as this winter squash that you'll see growing all through here and these tomatoes. Now I've got several different small fruited tomato varieties planted along this cattle panel trellis here. This variety is one called Coyote. I planted this because of its resistance to septoria leaf spot, which is a big problem in my garden. And it's definitely one of the healthiest plants I've ever grown. Usually by this point in the season, my tomatoes have a ton of foliar die off from disease. And this one really has very little, still a lot of healthy growth. Very, very productive. In fact, like <laughs> many cherry and currant types, it's almost too productive. This, honestly, not my flavor favorite. It's very, very sweet. I think some people would love this. Kids would probably love it. I like more acid in my tomatoes, so I really like more of a counterbalance to that sweetness. But I know some folks can't do acidic tomatoes, so this might be a really great option. I've also got one called Perfection in Pink, and this is a pink fruited indigo type. So you can see it's got that indigo coloration, but the under color is this kind of raspberry pink. And some of these where they don't really get sunlight exposure, they stay almost entirely pink. And that's pretty typical of any of these indigo type tomatoes. This one, you can see not as disease resistant, a lot more foliar die off, and I'm not even honestly sure which disease this had, but relatively healthy for this point in the season and extremely productive. Good flavor, a little more savory than the coyote. Still not an all time flavor favorite, but I'm pleased with the performance overall. My long standing favorite indigo type is still Midnight Snack. And then I also had Cherry Ember, a really pretty tomato, but terrible performance in my garden. These plants have been really weak and spindly. Just average flavor. This is not going to be a variety that I grow again. I've got rye cover crop planted in here. This is where I had potatoes earlier this spring. And then back here, <laughs> this really beautifully healthy pumpkin vine has done great. Unfortunately, this is a giant pumpkin type and I planted this late. It's got one fruit on it. And this thing, unfortunately, is not going to ripen before the frost. It also had a very open um, blossom end scar, which is not great because, as you can see, it, it can lead to rotting if that scar end doesn't close up correctly. But I may try this variety again, starting it earlier next year, because this plant is really impressive. Through this central back part of the garden, this is where I've got the majority of my fall crops planted. some rye cover crop again right here. Peas, peas are always
always dicey in the fall here. If we get a hot, dry July and August, they don't tend to do well. I do actually have some mature pods on here, but these would typically look a lot better. Some beets that I really need to get in here and thin. That's some lettuce planted. And then this row is entirely brassicas. I've got kohlrabi, cabbage, Chinese cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower in this row. Now, typically, I do not recommend planting all one species all together. I definitely have better results typically when I break things up. So maybe have some brassicas, then some herbs, then some carrots, rather than grouping all my brassicas together. This was simply an ease of care situation where I knew that I need to have all these under nets and eventually frost covers. It's a heck of a lot easier to do one long row than it is to try to use frost covers or blankets or netting in all these small sections all over the garden. It's also easier to set up drip line irrigation down one row versus having it all over the garden. So that's why I did this whole big group planting. The trouble with grouping all my brassicas together is I'm just basically creating a buffet for insect pests that like this plant. In this case, the cabbage worms, and you may even see some of the cabbage white butterflies flitting through the frame as you're watching. Typically, again, I would have these all under insect netting. That's one of my very best defenses against cabbage worms. And I will do these hoops, I will put the netting on, I will pin it into the ground as soon as I set out transplants. I clearly did not get that done this year. And I've been having to switch out between shade covers and no shade covers and netting and all kinds of different things going on here. So right now they're just exposed to all the pests. I've been checking these every day, hand squishing worms when I find them, and then also spot spraying with BT. But now that it looks like the temperatures are finally dropping, I'm probably going to do one last all over spray with BT to kill any existing cabbage worms, and then I will cover these with netting. Harvest on most of these varieties will start likely at the end of October into about the mid to the end of November. And at some point later into the season, I'll have to go in and swap out that insect netting with frost cover. But all of these crops are extremely cold tolerant and actually do a lot better when the weather gets colder. I mentioned that shade cloth earlier, and that's something that I've not really used that much of in the past. This year was the first year that I used it pretty extensively, both in the spring, it got really, really warm in April. And then again, as I mentioned for my fall plantings, Ohio's always kind of had weather that's all over the place, but it does seem to be getting even more erratic. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. So adding season extenders, um, protection like shade cloth into my gardening toolbox is gonna just become a mainstay for me. I don't know that I'm gonna be able to garden the way that I want to without using things like shade cloth. I've used the frost cloth for a long, long time. Definitely if you're in Ohio or in a similar climate and you're not already using shade cloth, frost cloth, insect netting, I, I really suggest investing in some because it's made a big difference in my garden. more cover crop here. This is some cowpeas and millet and a few other things. I actually smashed this all down once and you can see the cowpeas growing up through it. These will all die off when that frost hits. Tomatoes. Chard volunteer calendula, holy basil. This is more cover crop. Again, this is that millet and cowpea, and I forget, I think I had a few other things in here, but you can see the millet and cowpea have really taken over. This millet should have been cut before these seed heads formed, but it was so pretty, I just left it. I'm sure I'll have a lot of volunteers last year, but this has been a really neat cover crop and I'll definitely use millet again. These are some lovely Alaska nasturtium. 
This variegated foliage is really neat. And remember, nasturtiums are edible. They add a nice peppery flavor to salads. Tiller radish cover crop that went in after my melons and shell beans. And then up here, okra. This variety is Jing orange. And yes, okra can be grown in the north. It actually does really, really well in Ohio. I like Jing orange because <laughs> it's pretty. Um, it does taste really good. It's not quite as mucilaginous as some of your other okras, which some people might actually like about it, but it's a gorgeous edible ornamental. Now these I have planted a little close and again, didn't get the water they probably would have liked to have had. And I am slacking on harvesting here, as you can probably tell. I've mentioned this before, but again, with okra, pods like this are too big. This is gonna get tough and woody and nasty and not any good for eating. It'll vary by variety a bit, but I like to aim for a pod closer to this size. Outside of the garden fence, and <laughs> a lot of this stuff looks really rough. Again, this is because of lack of rain. Jerusalem artichoke here. Typically, this doesn't start dying off for me till the very end of October. And I won't harvest the tubers till after the frost, but you can see how much of this has died back already. We're getting a lot of early leaf color changing back in the woods around us again, because it's been so dry. Now back here in what was predominantly the sweet corn and watermelon bed, I made a really dumb mistake this year and one that I know better than to make. So the farmers all around me, this was a field corn year versus a soybean year. And I was trying really hard to time out my sweet corn so that I didn't have any issues with cross pollination. Well, I waited and waited and waited to plant. Unfortunately, so did the farmers. So I ended up with a batch of sweet corn that was cross-pollinated with field corn and the eating quality greatly suffered because of it. It was still edible, but a lot of this ended up just being chicken food. Now, luckily I had a batch over at my parents as well. So we got our sweet corn fix this year, but this was definitely a disappointment. On the other side of the sweet corn, the melons that you see still left in here are just some that didn't ripen before the vines died back. This will all be chicken food as well. Believe it or not, this mess behind me was gorgeous earlier in the year. This is one of my Hugel culture beds. I have a lot of fruit planted in here, but I also ended up with a lot of volunteer sunflowers. And they were lovely. They look horrible now because obviously they're all dead and brown, but the birds have been enjoying these seeds so much that I'm just gonna leave these up as long as there are seeds left and work on cleaning all of this out later into the fall and winter. Behind me, another of my Hugel culture beds. In the past, I've been using this for annual vegetable plantings. It's worked really, really well, but I think I wanna convert this to more of a perennial or permaculture site. I'm not sure what I wanna do in here though. I do have one apricot tree in here and I need a, to plant another as a pollinator, but other than that, I'm open to suggestions. So if you all have ideas for perennial edible plants that are gonna be really low maintenance, um, disease-free type of plants. Drop a line in the comments below and let me know. But I am hoping to get this planted out with something this coming spring. Over here, unfortunately, my poor Concord grape vine. This thing has been so abused uh, between spray drift damage the last couple years. And now our support finally bit the dust and this wood post rotted out the whole support collapsed earlier this summer. So this is gonna be a fall, winter, spring fix it project, getting a new grape trellis built. And I'm not sure if I'm gonna have to actually cut this grape completely back, or if we're gonna be able to actually put up a new post and support this existing cattle panel, because right now this grape is so entwined in this cattle panel, there's, there's no moving it to a different support. So we'll see how that goes. And I wanted to show you guys one last spot over here for today. This is not strictly vegetable garden, but related in a way. 
So for any of you who follow along with the channel, you may have heard me mention that I got nailed with herbicide spray drift this spring. So very unfortunately common occurrence for a lot of home gardeners, and I'm doing more research into what can be done about this. But in the meantime, one of my big focuses is figuring out ways to create a physical barrier. So we're pretty much blocked off by woods on all but the east and north sides of our property. This is a much bigger deal actually at my parents' home where they're exposed on three of the four sides of their land. But we still get spray drift coming through here. So whereas I wanted to originally convert this area into more of, again, like an edible perennial planting, now my focus is just on plants that will block and are resistant to herbicide drift. So I've got some Allegheny viburnum planted in here. These are really, really tough shrubs. I'm looking at doing some additional plantings of arborvitae. I wanna use some elderberries along this border. And I actually talked to a gentleman at a forest farming conference in Southeastern Ohio this past weekend. They gave me a really good idea I hadn't thought about before. And his suggestion was to actually use vines as a temporary measure to prevent herbicide drift. So while I'm waiting for some of these trees and shrubs to mature, he suggested building a tall trellis and doing something like hops, which is very, very quick growing. Even if it gets totally nailed with herbicide, it's quick to grow back. And it gives me protection in a season versus waiting three, five, 10, 20 years for some of these other plantings to grow up and be large enough to block. So I don't know if I'll get to that. I may actually do that at my parents versus here. We'll see, I'll definitely keep you updated. But this is gonna be one of the big projects I'm focusing on this fall and next spring as well. So that pretty much covers what is going on in my garden right now, but I'd love to hear from you. Drop a line in the comments below and let me know what is happening in your garden here in the month of October. And if you enjoyed today's video, please consider subscribing to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.